Hi, I'm Glyn Dewis and welcome to my Photoshop Power Session here at the second Photoshop Virtual Summit. Now, to be honest with you, I was kind of struggling with a name for this particular class because it's really a mixture of content covering a number of random things, but whatever it is, I've included it to make your using Photoshop much more productive. I'm going to be showing you how we can get Photoshop to automatically do tasks for us without us having to tell it to do it. It'll just know what you want and when you want it. And this is really handy for those tasks that you do time and time again. But it'll also stop you saving multiple copies of the same file. It'll even automatically delete files you don't need and so keep your folders nice and tidy. We're also going to be looking at the best settings in Photoshop for saving images to go on places like Facebook, both landscape and portrait orientation, and how we can do that super fast. But then we'll go through a quick color correction technique, how never to forget what you did to an image, and more. Right, there's lots to get through, so let's crack on. All right, so to kick things off, let's look at a really quick way that we can color correct our images. It might be that if you're a photographer, you've been out and you maybe didn't have a gray card with you to take a picture of during the photo shoot to then use as reference later on. All is not lost. There is a way we can do that in Photoshop very, very quickly. On screen, we've got this picture here where there's a little bit of a green color cast to it. That's intentionally been put onto it, but let's just say we want to make it look more natural. The way we're going to do that is go to the adjustments in the top right hand corner of the screen where we've got all manner of adjustments we could use, two of which are levels and curves. Now it doesn't really matter which one we choose, I'll just click on curves for argument's sake. When we bring it up we get the properties as we always do no matter what adjustment layer we're going to use, but here we have a button called auto. So for us to get uh, as good a colour correction as we can as possible, what I'm going to do is hold down the option key on Mac or Alt key on Windows, and I'm going to click where it says Auto. And when I do that, it brings up the Auto Color Correction options. And it might vary which one that you have selected here by default. Now to make sure that the colors are correct, one way we can do that is this. One of the options we have is Find Dark and Light Colors. I'm going to choose that one. And already we can see that it's made quite a difference to the picture, especially where we can see it notable in the sky. So that's looking good already, but we can take it a step further. We can choose Snap Neutral Midtones by putting a little tick in that checkbox. So now we pretty much have a great color corrected image. I can then click OK. Now the only problem with this is, let's just delete this curves adjustment here. If I now go back to my um, curves and then we go and have a quick look at this auto again. I'm going to hold down the option key on Mac, Alt key on Windows, click on auto. You can see that it's kind of gone back to the one it was originally set at. So when we do come in the first time to use this technique to color correct our images, choose find and dark and light colors, put a tick in the snap neutral midtones, and then right at the bottom on the left hand corner, save as defaults. Definitely put a little tick in that checkbox and then click OK. So now we've got our great color corrected image. If I just delete that, we can go back again. Let's go to curves. We'll click on auto and it looks absolutely bang on. And the great thing is if we just check to see what the auto settings were, we can see that it's maintained fine dark and light colors and snap neutral midtones. So just click OK. Now we can use that from now on until we change it on any other image. So for example, on this particular one here, this one here needs color correcting. So again, I'll go up to my curves adjustment. This time, all I need to do is just click on auto because we've already saved those color correction settings in there and they'll remain there until we change them. I'll just click on auto and it color corrects the image for us. So that's just a really quick way that you can color correct your images if you didn't have a gray card at the time that you can then use as a reference. Okay, so I think it's fair to say that live streaming has become an integral part of our everyday life now, be it for business or for keeping in touch with friends and loved ones. And that's certainly been the case with me. I've been doing a lot more of this stuff now for business. And because of that, I've wanted to increase the production value. So on the screen, you can see a graphic that I've come up with where I've got my nameplate, my web address, and also this transparent area. 
And with the live streaming software that I currently use, this, when I bring this graphic into that software, this transparent area is where my camera view will be. So it kind of just looks a bit more professional. Now, if I was making this just for me, absolutely fine, no problems. I make it once, I save it, and then jobs are good and we can just crack on. However, what I've also wanted to do is bring in guests. So the guests also need to have their nameplate with their web address. And also what I wanted to do was to have two areas whereby I'd be on one side with my details underneath and the guest would be on the, on the other side with their details underneath. Now, the only problem with this is, obviously as time goes by, more guests come in, it means me having to update this document. And I guess really if I've got the time, it's not much of an issue. However, it can get a little bit tedious. It would be fantastic if there was a way that Photoshop could do this for me. Ordinarily, I would need to open up each of the actual folders containing the elements that are in this particular graphic, navigate to where the guest name is, double click and then type the new name in. And then I'd have to go back down to the other graphic, which is the one just underneath, and do exactly the same thing. If there was a way I didn't have to do that, I'm all for it, and that's what I want to show you now. So what we're going to do is this. I'm going to go to the File menu and choose New. And we're going to choose a document size that is exactly the same as what we've currently got open, which is 1920 by 1080. It's going to have a white background, and we'll click Create. Once we've got that, I'll go back to my original document and let's just scroll down to where we've got the name. This is this folder just here where it says name guest. And if I open that up, you can see there's Dave Cross and then is his web address. I've got those both into a group. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually click on this with my move tool and drag it into my document right to the very top where the tabs are and hold it over the tab for my new document. Still holding down, I'm going to bring it in on top of the white space. Now you can see while I'm holding this down, the layers over on the right hand side are still the same layers from my original document. But the moment I let go, you'll see that it kind of updates. So we've got our original background and now above it, we've got the group containing the name and the web address. So what I can do is just save this as a file that I can then place into my design. And that's gonna save me a ton of time. Let me show you what I mean. Let's first of all just change this. I'll get the name and we'll call this one Dave Elson. That's my uncle's name, the very man who got me into photography and we'll give him a web address of made up website.com, something like that. And then we'll save that. So now close the group up. Let's just turn off that uh, white background because when we place this into our document we don't want to have that white background on it so you can see now transparent areas so let's go file save as and we'll save it in my live broadcasts folder and i think i'll just call this something really simple like guest name plate there we go and click save and we can actually close that so now then going back over to my document that I'm going to be using with my live streaming software. Here's what we'll do. I'm going to go to my uh, guest template here. And here is the group where I originally had the name that I manually typed in. Now I'm going to get rid of that. We don't need to have that. But what I will do is go file, place linked, navigate to my guest name template, and then place it. And that's going to bring that into this document. All I need to do is just reposition it, have it right down the bottom like there, and put that there like that. And then what we'll do is we'll go to the top graphic, which is where it's got me and the guest on the other side. So I'll do the same thing. Open it all up, look for the folder that contains where it says the guest name, which is that one just there, and we'll delete it. We don't need that because that's where I manually typed it in. But what I will do is go File, Place Linked, navigate to the guest name template, choose place, and then I'll just move that over, put it into position, and about there is looking good. All right, so now that we've got that, we can see as we scroll through, there's my original nameplate, there's the guest nameplate on the, on the single view, and there is the dual view with me and the guest side by side. 
So let's just say then we've had this uh, live broadcast with this person called Dave Elson. And then later on today, we've got another interview with somebody else. Rather than me having to go into the folders and manually change them, this is what I need to do. I just need to go to my live broadcast folder and open up the document that has the name and the web address of the guest. Let's just turn on that background layer just so we can see that underneath. So all I need to do then, let's just double click to change the name here. We'll call this one Dave Cross. And we'll change the name of the website again. So we'll go www.psummit.com and commit that. And we'll turn off that background layer and I'll just go File and Save. So now when we go back over to our original template, we can see now it's already updated. It says Dave Cross on that one. If we go down to the guest one beneath, it says Dave Cross on that one. So all I need to do is just have one file that contains the name of the guest and their web address, and it'll update every single element where I have place linked that name into this document here. A massive, massive time saver. Now, carrying on from the previous session where we saved a lot of time just using place linked, now we are really, really going to turn on the turbo boost and move things on at a heck of a pace. I'm going to show you now a fantastic way that you can get Photoshop to save you even more time by saving your document in whatever format you want, however many different copies, without you even going to save it. It does it all for you. It is absolutely fantastic. And what we're going to do for that is use something called Generator, Photoshop Generator. Now, you'll find that when you go to the File menu. As you come down, halfway down, you'll see this word Generate and Image Assets. If you're anything like me, for quite some time you've seen that and thought, I wonder what that does. Because whenever you click on it, nothing seems to happen. Just watch how this can change things for you. Now, ordinarily, if we just kind of backtrack, let's forget Generator just for a second. Let's just say that I've now gone through and made the graphics that I want for my uh, next live stream. We've changed the names using that place linked. What I would have to do every single time now is go File, Save As, and then I'd need to name this one as something like uh, Guest and Glyn, and then find choose where I want to save it, choose the format, which have to be PNG, because I need to keep all this transparency so that the cameras show up, and then click Save. I'd have to do it then. I'd have to do it for the one beneath. And then obviously, I probably already have one saved with me in it, but I'd have to kind of repeat it several times. With the generator, I do not need to do that. At the moment, let's just go to File and Open to have a look at the folder where I've got my uh, elements saved at the minute. We can see the guest nameplate, which we made in the previous session. And here is the interview template, the one that you can see on screen, saved as a PSD, a Photoshop file, so that I retain all those layers, all those groups, and what have you. There's nothing else in there. However, if I now go to the File menu, go down to where it says Generate, and choose Image Assets, it kind of looks like nothing's happened. But if I now go back to the file menu, choose Generate, we can see there is a tick now next to the words Image Assets. Let's have a look back in that folder. So we go File and Open. Now we see we've got the PSD file. We've got the guest nameplate. But now we have a folder in here called Interview Template Dash Assets. OK, so what on earth now does that basically mean? Well. Now we've got that and Generator is turned on. And by the way, that's only turned on for this particular open document. If I had other documents open, Generator, when we went to the File menu, Generator would not be ticked. It's only specifically for the one that you've turned it on that you've got open. But now over in the Layers panel, you can see all the different groups that I've got that make up all the different elements or different uh, graphics that I want to use within my live stream. What I can now do is this. Where the name I've put this, where the name is of this group, it says Glyn and Guest. If I double click on that so it's highlighted, I can then get my flashing cursor. And at the end of it, I'm going to put dot PNG. Because that's the file format really that I'd want to be able to save this out as because it's going to maintain the actual um, transparency. Just press enter. 
So at the moment, it looks like we'll have just named the, group, the actual group there that. However, let's go to the file menu, choose open, and now let's open up this little folder called interview template dash assets. And look what's inside. We've got this graphic here now called glyn and guest dot png. If I open that up, we have actually got a PNG file at the size it needs to be. Let's have a look here. Image, image size, 1920 by 1080. That's good to go. It's absolutely good to go. It's automatically saved it for me, which is fantastic. If we go back to my open document, let's say now uh, the guest one. Let's have a look at guest. Dave Cross at the bottom there. If I call this group here, let's just go for guest dot png press enter or return let's have a look again in that folder file open and there we have guest.png as well so it's automatically updating so whatever extension i put at the end of the group name is what the generator is automatically saving for us in that particular folder it might be that we want to call this a jpeg so let's have a look at it. let's make this a jpeg so we put jpg and then press enter let's go back to the folder file open and now we have guest.png and the glinnon guest has now become a jpeg even better than that because if you're anything like me your folders in your on your computer get full up with copies of copies of copies you have multiple versions of the same files but let's look now if i actually take out the extension off that file name so it's just called glyn and guest then we go file open and now it's gone we've only got the guest so not only saves the files for you so that you can just get on and start using them it also removes them when you don't need them and a massive massive time saver now to carry on from that you could also let's just say that you know this doesn't just happen to happen to be on a on a design this could be a photo that maybe you're editing it'll do exactly the same thing but the great thing here is as well is you can get generator to save multiple versions of not just your groups but you could actually assign an extension to maybe just the name of a layer you could have a layer in here that you're going to call something let's say you've got guest nameplate let's just put a dot png at the end of that and go back to that folder file open guest nameplate dot png let's just get rid of that there all right so let's just say also that maybe at the moment this one here let's have a look at the size again image image size it's 1920 by 1080 let's just say that you wanted to save another version of this maybe at a different size well we can do that as well if i just go back to this top one here in fact let's just let's use a different one Let's go for glyn.png. So we're at glyn.png because I definitely want a PNG for that to use in my live streaming. But I'm also going to want a different sized version. This, this might be a design, let's say, advertising the live stream that I'm coming up. So I want one to use on the live stream, but maybe one to use on my website. So let's have a look. I'm going to go um, comma. And I'll make this one, instead of 1920 by 1080, let's scale it down a bit. I'll go for 1280 by 720. And I'll call this Glyn website dot jpg. And now when we go file and open within that folder, we've got glyn website dot jpg. If I open that up and we go to image, image size, 1280 by 719 720 for argument's sake but we've also still got in there glyn.png and the guest.png so as you can see that there's going to save you a ton of time but even more so let's just go back and take these extensions out here we only want to have uh, each of these groups i'm going to have an extension .png on that one png on the guest and we'll have this one up here as well so dot png now check this out let's go back to our original nameplate so we will go to uh, live broadcasts there's our guest nameplate and we click open let's just turn on that white light so i can see this and let's just change the name and we'll call this one john smith and the website 
we'll say is jsmith.com and commit that and we'll turn off that background layer and we'll just save it. Now when we go back, of course our document here has been updated so we've got the guest names changed there. It's also changed on the nameplate but also if we go back to our folder where all this is stored, our interview template assets, let's have a look at the Glyn and guest. Has that changed? Yep, that's changed. Let's go to open and we'll try the guest. That one has changed as well. So not only can we use the generator to automatically save multiple versions of our file automatically without us having to go the long way around, we can also get it to update and save versions again when we use the place linked. This is a huge time saver when you combine them together. So that's generator and place linked. All right, so for this session, I want to give you more of a tip as opposed to a technique. And this is to do with getting images onto Facebook and ensuring that they look their very best. If you're anything like me, you've noticed that when we upload images to Facebook, especially out of all the social media platforms, it just seems to get compressed and just really does lose its edge. So I wanna share with you my settings. And then in the next session, I wanna show you how we can take it a step further. But just for now, here we have a landscape orientated picture that I've done. My settings to get them onto Facebook are as follows. First of all, let's have a look at the size. This is a full sized image. So we've got image, image size, and you can see here it's quite a large image, 4,565 pixels on the width by 2413 on the height. Now there are a number of different sizes that Facebook themselves recommend to upload images. And one of them is 2,048 pixels on the long edge. So that's what I'm going to do with this particular image here. So what we'll do is this. We'll go to the image menu, first of all, and then go to image size. Now in here, we've got the width and the height. I'll change the actual width here to 2048 pixels, but I'll make sure that in the resample section at the bottom here, where we've got a number of different choices, choose, if we're reducing the size of the image, we're gonna choose by cubic sharper, and in brackets, we can see here for reduction. By default, you'll probably find that it's set to automatic. You're not going to get the best results when you leave it in automatic. So kind of dive in there and choose bicubic sharper if you're going to be making the image smaller, which we obviously are in this case. So bicubic sharper, and then we'll go for 2048 on the width, the longest edge, and then click OK. Once we've done that, we'll then go to the file menu and choose export save for web legacy. Now in here, there's just a few settings we need to make sure. The best setting for uploading your images onto Facebook isn't JPEG, it's actually gonna be the PNG format. And you've got two choices, PNG 24 or PNG 8. The highest quality, PNG 24. And yes, it does make the file size, certainly when you've got 2048 pixels on the long edge, it does make it rather big, but hey, does it matter? We want our images to look as good as they possibly can. So PNG 24 is the way to go. We also need to make sure that it says convert to sRGB and we can see here how that's going to look. It's looking pretty good in the preview. Now at the bottom as well, we can see we've got the image size, the width 2048. We also do have the choice here if we're gonna be making the image smaller of choosing the sampling method. And you can see here we've got bicubic sharper. Now you could, if you know which one to use, just come straight into this save for web dialog and choose the correct uh, interpolation method there. But the reason I chose first of all to go to image size is because you can see which one it is that you would need to use. But you can see by cubic sharper. Once we've done that, we'll then click save. I'll then choose the folder that I want to save them into. It's on my desktop, a folder called social, and then we'll just click save like so. So now if we close that, don't bother saving the original and keep that at the full size, but we'll go back to open and we'll go to my desktop, choose social, get that Lancaster image so we can see here it is. And if we go to image, image size and the width there, 2048, it's been made to a 72 resolution ideal for the web. So that's the simple settings that you can use for uploading your images onto Facebook to make sure they look their very best. In the next session, we'll take it up a step.
All right, so in the last session, we looked at the settings that I use in Photoshop to resize images before uploading them onto Facebook to ensure they look their very best. Now, it might be that you have a folder full of images that you want to upload to Facebook, so you'd maybe not want to have to do that manually for each and every one. So now we're going to look at creating an action, but then we're going to move on to create something called a conditional action. And you'll see why we need to do that in a moment. But first of all, let's record an action for resizing the images, getting them ready for Facebook. So in Photoshop, I'll come over to my Actions panel on the right-hand side. If you don't see that, you'll just need to go to the Window menu at the top, and you'll see the option here to click on Actions, and that'll open up the panel. By default, you'll see there's already a folder in here with a number of different different actions. Those are the ones that will be supplied within Photoshop but we need to create our own set with our own actions in. So I'm going to come to the bottom, click on the little icon here to create a new set, and I'll just call this Glyn's Actions. Now, any actions that I make, I'll save into this folder so they're going to be easier to find. To create an action, I'll come to the bottom where we've got this little plus icon, so we click on that, and I'm going to call this action Facebook Wide 2048. The reason I'm actually calling it 2048 is because we're going to be resizing these to 2048 pixels like we did in the last session. This uh, action is going to be saved into the set Glyn's Actions, which is obviously what we want from the Actions panel. We could speed this process up even more if our keyboard has got F keys, so we can assign an F key to really do that quickly. We're not going to bother with that for now. We could also assign a color to this particular action. Now, I'm actually going to do that. We'll choose red. You won't see why I'm doing that just yet, but you will in a short time. So now we're going to click Record. Once I've clicked Record, over in the Actions panel, you can see now the name of the action with like a down arrow, and at the bottom, we've got this Record button that's now active. So Photoshop is now waiting for me to do the steps to resize the image. It's worth noting at this point that Photoshop isn't recording in real time, so you don't have to rush through to get this done as quickly as possible. Photoshop is only recording the actual steps you do in Photoshop. So you can take as long as you want to do this. But now let's go through the process of doing the resizing as we did before. So we'll go to the image menu and we'll choose image size. And on the longest edge, the width here is 9194. So I'm going to change that to 2048, making sure as before that because I'm reducing it, we're going to choose the bicubic sharper reduction as our resample and we'll click OK. That resizes it. We then go to the File menu, choose Export, Save for Web Legacy. We then, in the preset, we make sure that we choose the PNG 24, and then looking further down, Convert to sRGB, making sure that uh, checkbox is ticked, and we can see at the bottom, 2048 is the width. The height just happens to be uh, 1110 pixels, quality by cubic sharper if we were resizing it within this dialog but we've already done that we'll then click save and i'll navigate to a folder on my computer desktop uh, called social and we'll just leave the file name the same as it is and click save and then go to file and close we don't want to save the original so we'll click don't save now when we do that it comes back to the home screen for photoshop so to get back to our kind of desktop our workspace we can either press escape or just click on the Photoshop icon in the top left hand corner because now we need to stop the action. So we click on stop and there we go. The record action is finished. So here are all the settings that we have for our resizing and saving our image ready for Facebook. And you can see here all the settings 2048. We've got the export where we saved it into the PNG format and what have you. So everything is there. Now we can check that that's working. Let's just go and open up another. Uh, landscape image. So here we've got another wide landscape image. I'll close down the action and just click on the name there and then click play and you'll see that it goes really quickly and all of a sudden it'll disappear. So now if we go to our file and open we'll navigate to our social folder and there it is. There's the Wales picture, there's the BMW picture and there's the Lancaster one from earlier on. So we know now that that action is working. Now you may wonder why we gave it a color. That's because if we had a lots and lots and lots of actions in there that we'd made, we've got to then try and find them. If I've only got just one, it's easy. But if you've got loads, you're going to have to find them. So a lot of people tend to use something called button mode. 
To access button mode in the actions panel top right hand corner, just click these lines at the top here, click on those, you get this drop down menu and we can choose button mode. And what will happen there is all that the actions that you have will be on display but by their colours. Now all these ones here are the ones that were the default ones provided already in Photoshop but you can see here very very easy to find is my Facebook wide 2048 action. The great thing about this is I don't need to click on the name then click, click on the plus icon I just literally just click on top of the actual icon and it'll do it for me. So that's button mode. Now the problem comes with this if I now go open a portrait orientated image, like this one here of my friend Ian Munro, where the width is actually the shortest side, the height is the longest side. And if I now click on my Facebook uh, action to resize it and then click play and then go to file and open, let's open that image up. What we'll notice is if we go to image and image size, it's resized the width to 2000, 2048, but the height is now 2476. We need the longest edge to be at 2048 for this image to look its best. But Photoshop is only resizing the width, and that's because that's what we recorded when we did the action. So somehow we need to tell Photoshop to know if our image is landscape, to make the long edge, the width 2048, and if it's portrait, to make the height 2048, because that's the longest edge. So this is what we're going to do. First of all, we need to open up an image that is portrait orientated and then record an action for it. So we'll come to the bottom, click on the plus icon, and rename this action Facebook Tall 2048 pixels. We'll save it into the Glyn's actions. We won't assign a function key but we will give it a color and we'll click record. So we go through the same process now. We go to image, image size. This time we choose the height because it's the height that's got the longest edge there. That needs to be at 2048 pixels. By cubic sharper, reduction is the one that we're using for the resample and then we click OK. Then we go to file, export, save for web legacy. PNG 24 is our file choice, convert to sRGB and then click save and then navigate to that social folder, click on save and then we go to file and close. Don't save the original, it takes us now to our Photoshop home page to get back to the workspace, press escape or click on the Photoshop icon and then we click stop on the action. So now we've got two actions one for resizing and saving wide images or landscape images and one for resizing and saving tall images or portrait orientated images the only issue now is if we do have a folder of images that we want to work on and they're a mixture of tall and wide we've got to physically come in and choose which one of these actions to apply every single time to make this quicker, we can use what's called a conditional action. So Photoshop can decide what the image is and then choose the wide or the tall. So here's what we need to do. I'm going to click on the plus icon. This one I'm going to call Facebook Settings. We'll leave it in the Glyn's Action Sets. Again, I will give it a color of red and we'll click on Record. And all I need to do is come to the fly out menu in the top right hand corner of the actions panel and choose insert conditional. Now this here, this is kind of like, I don't know, years ago when we used to read these kind of like fantasy books. It would say, if you want to go through the door, turn to page 50. If you want to go straight ahead, turn to page 42. It's kind of like that really. So here we have a load of if statements. So if the document is landscape, then what do you want to do? Well, if it's landscape, then play the Facebook wide action. If it's not wide, then just play the Facebook tool. So if the document is landscape orientated, play wide. And if it's not, play tall. There's actually loads of different uh, conditions that you can have in here that you could choose from. So you could create some really intricate and detailed actions. But for us, all we need to do is this one here. This is going to work a treat. We'll click OK and then we stop. So it doesn't really matter now which image we open up, Photoshop will be able to know 
which of these two actions to apply. For example, let's just open up a couple of images. Okay, so here we've got a portrait or a tool image, and all I'm going to do is click on the Facebook settings action and click play. Then I've got this landscape orientated image, and again, I'm just using the Facebook settings action and clicking play. Let's now open them up. File and open. Navigate to that social folder. Here's those two images. Let's just click on both of those just to check what's happened. So here's the portrait one. It should be that the height is set to 2048. Let's have a look. Image, image size, height, 2048. So that's definitely worked. And if we go to the wide picture, we go to image, image size, the width is the longest edge, 2048. So by us creating this conditional action, Photoshop will then know by looking at it and saying, is it landscape? or is it portrait? That's all well and good, but in the next session, let's show you how we can take this a step even further to speed things up. All right, so now that we've got all our actions set up, we've got the Facebook wide, the Facebook tool, and also the Facebook settings where we have a conditional action so that Photoshop can decide what to do depending on whether the image is landscape or portrait orientated. Now the problem here is what we don't want to do is to have to click on this action again and again if we have a folder of images that we want to process. We can actually use something called batch. Now if I go to the file menu and then we choose automate, here is the batch option. And this is where we can kind of set Photoshop up to choose actions from our set we can get it to choose the action that we want. And then we can say, this here is the folder of images that we want to process, be it one, 10, 100, 1,000, or thousands and thousands of images. We can tell it to choose that folder there. These little check boxes here are if we have any kind of stoppages within our actions, we can override those by putting ticks in the necessary one. We don't have an issue with those at all. Over here is where we can choose, once you've processed them, this is where to save them. And you can see I've already got this one set up to save in the social folder. We also have the override action save as commands. We put a tick in there, and then we can use these little areas here to rename the file once it's processed it. And then we would click OK. The trouble is we need to do that every single time. The other problem is that Photoshop remembers the previous settings that you had. So let's just say now that we've already got our Facebook export already set up in the batch. We then go and create another batch for another set of actions. If we then want to use the Facebook batch, we've got to recreate it all over again. And that kind of defeats the object of making things quick and automated. A better way to do it is using droplets. So this is what we do. We go to File, Automate, Create Droplet. And when we do this, you'll see that this large dialog box comes up here, pretty similar to the batch ones. So first of all, we'll choose where we want the droplet to be saved. So we'll go choose, and we'll save it onto the desktop. And you can see here, I've already, re I've already named this one Facebook Settings, and .app is the actual extension for this droplet icon. We'll click on Save. We then say that this droplet is going to use a specific action, and that action is found in my set, and the one we're going to use is the one called Facebook Settings. We don't need to put any tick in these checkboxes here. We then say, once you've processed them, this is where I want you to save them out in the desktop social folder. We'll override the Save As command, and then we're going to rename them. So you can see here, I've got the document name, followed by underscore FB for Facebook, and then the extension. So that'll be my file underscore FB dot GIF dot PNG dot JPEG. And then we'll click OK. So now if we minimize Photoshop so we can see the desktop, here we have our icon, this is our droplet. And all I would need to do if I had a single image, I could click and drag it on top of the icon and it'll process it and save it into the social folder. Or I could have a folder of images like I have here, different orientations, so we've got, we've got tall, we've got square, we've got landscape. I could drag those on top of the icon, it'll then process them and save them in the social folder which you can see at the moment is completely empty. So let's give it a go. Let's get these images here, drag the icon on top of the droplet, and then let go. So 
So Photoshop has now processed all those images. So let's just minimize it. We'll then go back to the desktop and now look in what was an empty social folder. Now we can see there's a load of different images in there. So let's have a quick look to see how they've been resized. For example, the Dewis 3 one here. If we right click and get Get Info, the long edge should be 2048 pixels, which we can see here 2048. We've got this portrait orientated picture here. Get the information on that one. So right click, Get Info. Again, we can see the tall edge, the height is 2048. And we also have a square image here, a one by one crop. Let's get the Get Info. We can see here 2048 by 2048. All resized perfectly. And to be completely transparent, let's have a quick look in the original images that we dragged on top of the icon just to show what size they were. If I right click on that one, say Get Info, we can see now that the actual size of it was 7515 by 4600. So that droplet has successfully resized all those images and got them ready for me to upload onto Facebook by placing them into the social folder. A massive, massive time saver. Now, the last thing I want to show you is going to be really handy if you're somebody that is always kind of working on images and getting carried away, but then you kind of forget what it is that you've done so that you can't then go on and replicate the look on another image. Or maybe you're somebody that just wants to keep a record of all the steps that you did because you want to put a tutorial together. Well, there's actually a way you can get Photoshop to keep a written record of every single step that you do. That's what I want to show you now. So we've got this image open up on screen. It's actually a finished image, but we'll just do some steps to it to demonstrate what I mean about Photoshop recording stuff. So we'll go to the Photoshop menu first of all, then go to Preferences and we'll choose History Log. In here we have a little checkbox where we're going to turn on the History Log. We have to physically go in and do this. And then we're going to choose to have a text file. So Photoshop's going to write a text file with all the steps in. Where do we want it to be? Well, we're going to call this one, let's just rename this text file to Soldier Edit. And we'll put that on the desktop and we'll click Save. And then I've got a choice of what kind of report or written record do I want. Do I want it to be concise or do I want it to be detailed? Well, let's just kind of show you the difference. I'll click OK. And let's just do a few random steps on this picture just to demonstrate. I'll press Command or Control J to create a duplicate. I'll go to the filter menu and choose a camera raw filter. And when we're in camera raw filter, I'll just do a few things like increasing the exposure. Let's bring down the highlights uh, and increase the texture and the clarity. Just something like that. Click OK. And then once back in Photoshop, let's go and choose a color lookup table adjustment. We'll choose from the top menu here. Let's go for edgy amber and we'll take that down to maybe 20%. Something like that. So we've just done a few steps. Then I'm going to go to the file menu and choose save as and just save this out onto my desktop. And we'll just click it like so. Now once we've saved it, now we have access to the document telling us exactly what we did. And I'll go over to my desktop and just open that up and drag it over. So here's what we did. We created a copy, we went to the camera raw filter, then we added a lookup table, we modified the lookup table by lowering the opacity, and that's it. Now that's the concise report, which doesn't really tell you all the settings. So the one you're going to want to choose really is going to be the detailed. So let's now have a look at the difference. Let's go back to the Photoshop menu, preferences, and we'll choose history log. This time we'll change it to say detailed and then click OK. Let's just get rid of these bits here and just do a few more steps again. So let's try it now. We'll duplicate it. We'll go to the Filter menu and we'll go to Camera Raw. Once we're in Camera Raw, we'll increase the exposure to 0.35. We'll lower the highlights to minus 25. Increase the texture, plus 10, something like that, and click OK. Then we'll add a Color Lookup Table Adjustment layer. We'll choose that edgy amber and we'll take that down to 20%. Let's now save it out. So we go File, Save As, put it onto the desktop, click Save, like so. Now that we've saved it, let's go and open up that text file, which is on my desktop. 
and drag it over. And straight away, you can see a huge difference. So first of all, it says here we duplicated the, well, first of all, we deleted those layers. It's even recorded that. We created a copy. We went into the Camera Raw filter. Now this is listing everything within the Camera Raw. So you do need to search down for what it is that you did. Uh, and then coming further on down, we've got where we've added in the color lookup table adjustment. It says here we chose the edgy amber. We've reduced the opacity of it down to 20% and then we've saved it. So you can see it's incredibly detailed. The concise is too concise. The detailed, in my opinion, maybe a little bit too detailed. But that's just one way that you can get Photoshop to record everything that you've done. So you can go on and replicate it or create a tutorial. All right, so that's the end of the class, and I really do hope you've enjoyed it. If you've got any questions or comments, then please do drop me an email to glynn at glyndewis.com or simply through my website at glyndewis.com. In the meantime, though, I'll leave you to go and take in some more classes at the Virtual Summit. Catch you next time.